much concrete. Other materials, like steel or aluminum, can rust or corrode in water. The advantage of concrete is that water can make it stronger. Concrete needs water to complete its chemical reaction. If there's a little extra water around while it's going through the reaction, it just makes sure that all the concrete goes to completion in terms of its hydration. That's the chemical bonding caused by the water between the um, cement and the aggregate and the sand. In order to prevent leaks, the concrete mix for the locks has to be very dense, not allowing any water to seep through. The concrete that you need to build a canal it's not the kind of concrete that you need if you want to design a skyscraper. The recipe for the locks will try to be leak-proof. To solve this problem, builders choose smaller rocks for the aggregate in the mix. Tests show that adding finer aggregate creates a less porous concrete. The goal is a leak-proof lock that only expels water when the doors open. With the mix just right, engineers begin building the locks that will control the waterway between two oceans. At the Gatun locks on the Atlantic side, each lock chamber is big enough to hold three Statues of Liberty, laid end to end, with room to spare. At these locks alone, workers pour more than 1.53 million cubic meters of concrete. These locks link to the artificial lake made by damming the Chagres River, Gatun Lake. Nine years of construction. In May 1913, the last bucket of concrete is poured at the Gatun locks. Engineers prepare for the canal's first trial run the tugboat Katoon travels through the locks on September 26th of that year. The locks work flawlessly and open for business one year later. Few engineering endeavors have changed the geography of the planet like the Panama Canal. After nearly a century in action, the concrete of the Panama Canal has stood the test of time. No other material has withstood wear and tear in the same way. Concrete linked two oceans, but an even bigger challenge awaits. How will concrete tame one of America's wildest rivers? Now, go back inside the science of concrete. It has been called an American pyramid. The mighty Hoover Dam is a testament to the power of concrete. Weighing 6,600,000 tons, this concrete colossus holds back 45,000 pounds of water per square foot. The force of this water generates hydroelectric power for over a million people. From the neon lights of Las Vegas to the freeways of Los Angeles, this hydroelectric dam generates 2,080 megawatts of electricity. The Hoover Dam's construction redefined what the world could do with concrete, but it also rerouted one of America's greatest rivers, flooding ancient canyons, reshaping the area's natural habitat. In 1905, the Colorado River breaks free of a man-made canal. It floods Lower California across 150 square miles. Epic floods wipe out thousands of farmers. Millions of dollars are lost. The Colorado is unpredictable. The Southwest also has another problem, power. The boom towns of Los Angeles and Phoenix are growing at a rapid rate and desperately need energy. Raging floods and lack of power, two different problems. But engineers believe there is one answer to both. Dam the Colorado River. A hydroelectric plant would harness the natural power of the Colorado and using simple mechanics, convert that energy into much needed electricity. You're generally looking in the construction of a dam for a huge solid structure. It's really about holding back enormous quantities of water. 
The dam needs a material that is strong enough to hold back the raging Colorado. And since the location would be remote, able to be made on site. One material can meet all of those requirements. It's hard to imagine the Hoover Dam being built out of any material other than concrete. Using steel on this scale would be too costly. But to make the Hoover Dam, engineers would need more concrete than had ever been used before in one project. The dam will be 726 feet high and 1,244 feet wide. With a structure this big, it will be impossible to do one massive pour of concrete. The amount of material that got, went into this dam was so enormous that there's no way to pour the concrete in one segment. So what they did is they divided the whole dam into lifts and then into individual blocks. The Hoover Dam needs to be built as a series of individual blocks that will interconnect. Trapezoidal in shape, the blocks rise in five-foot lifts. This crucial engineering element allows the project to progress in stages. Something on that scale being built in concrete had not been built before. Hundreds of pounds per square inch, thousands of pounds per square foot on the base of the dam trying to push the dam downriver. And now you've got the Hoover Dam to stand this incredible water pressure trying to push it down the river. Chief Engineer Frank Crow knows the completed dam will have to hold back 45,000 pounds per square foot of water. For this, they need a special high-strength formula. Crow's solution? A minor but crucial modification to the standard concrete formula. A very dry mix, one that uses less water. More water makes it more workable, but shrinks more and shrinkage causes cracks. The less water, down to 7%, the better and stronger the concrete. The dam's remote location also means crews will have to build two concrete mixing plants on site. Shipping a very dry concrete formula from a facility far away would render it useless by the time it's transported to the dam. Because speed is of the essence when working with a very dry concrete mix, the crews working the pouring cranes have to push themselves to the limit to pour quickly and accurately. When concrete cures, it gives off a powerful heat, a result of the cement and water reacting to make the rock-hard substance. The process by which concrete cures, we call an exothermic reaction. By that, I mean it gives off heat. And indeed, if someone pours a sidewalk or driveway around you, right after the slab dries enough to touch, put your hand on it. It'll feel warm. That exothermic it gives off heat. You can feel sensible heat. As the amount of concrete going through this chemical reaction gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, the amount of heat that's given off gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Engineers calculate that if the dam were built in one continuous pour, the concrete would get so hot that it would take 125 years for it to cool to normal temperatures. The extreme heat would also cause the concrete to crack and crumble away. Concrete dries from the outside in. If the concrete is not evenly cooled, it can crack, putting the stability of the whole structure at risk. Instead, Frank Crow and his team of engineers have an innovative solution. Each block is outfitted with coils of thin-walled steel pipe. When the concrete is first poured, water from the Colorado River circulates through these pipes. The idea is to initiate a cooling process, but one done in stages. Cooling the concrete too quickly will cause it to crack. After the concrete has received its initial cooling, chilled water from a refrigeration plant is circulated through the coils to finish the cooling process. As each block is cooled, the pipes are cut off, and they are filled with grout by pneumatic grout guns, pumping 300 pounds per square inch of filler. Once the individual blocks have cooled and set, there is one final challenge. In order to prevent the hairline fissures between the blocks from weakening the dam, 
the individual blocks are formed with vertical interlocking grooves. When the concrete has cooled, grout is forced into these joints, bonding the entire structure into a monolithic concrete giant. This method takes advantage of one of concrete's fundamental properties. Concrete as a material is very strong in compression. To build a structure, instead of to make sure that the concrete is all in compression, you bend the beam like this. So now the water pushes on a column. Well, what's the water trying to do? It's trying to push that through. Well, it's the Pantheon Dome again. Only this time, it's the water trying to do it. It's trying to push the, the dome through the river gorge. What that does is put the whole structure in compression. Well, concrete loves compression. The more it is forced together while setting, the stronger concrete becomes. As a result of this property, the Hoover Dam is arguably stronger today than it was on opening day 70 years ago. The Hoover Dam is a testament to engineering know-how and a skillful use of concrete. The dam contains enough concrete to pave a strip 16 feet wide and 8 inches thick from San Francisco to New York. More than 5 million barrels of cement were used in the Hoover Dam, and a total of 21,000 men worked on its construction. And it represented an enormous engineering achievement to build successfully. It took the lives of over 100 men to build that dam. Today, the concrete mega dam is nothing new. But Hoover set the stage and showed the world that concrete could do the job and help generate much needed power. It changed the course of one of America's wildest rivers. Now the question is, can concrete conquer the skies? In the scorching Persian Gulf, a growing structure cuts the horizon. Its expected height is a closely guarded secret, but experts around the world agree the Burj Dubai may be the world's tallest skyscraper. It'll be the tallest building, for sure, the overall title holder for some time to come. A construction project this massive needs 11 cranes and the world's fastest high-capacity construction elevators. The building rises at the breakneck pace of one floor every four days. And from the walls to the floors, to the columns to the stairs, much of this desert skyscraper is concrete more than 160,000 cubic meters of it. At more than 2,000 feet, the Burj Dubai will be the crown jewel of the United Arab Emirates and is a shining example of a new generation of skyscrapers that seek to dominate the skies. It is a far cry from the humble beginnings of the concrete skyscraper more than a century ago. At the beginning of the 20th century, the building material of choice was not concrete, but steel. You can build a hell of a skyscraper with steel. In fact, the Empire State Building is so overbuilt, you could probably add another 30 stories to it under today's building codes, and it would still comply fine. So steel was a great material. You can build a great building from steel, but it's an expensive way to go. And steel is not only costly, but represents a challenge for a new generation of skyscrapers that grow increasingly higher. And if you're gonna go tall, the building's gotta be stiff. It is so much easier to make those thick, stiff walls from reinforced concrete than steel that it's a no-brainer. The Petronas Towers in Malaysia are concrete, and this new one in Dubai is gonna be concrete. If you're gonna go that high, it's gonna be concrete. The stiffness of concrete, combined with its availability and relatively low cost, have made it the building material of choice for these new skyscrapers. As our experience and comfort level of reinforced concrete uh, came along, and as the buildings started getting taller, reinforced concrete really became the material of choice. Before 1902, 
The tallest steel-reinforced concrete building is a paltry six stories tall.